Uh, hey everyone, my name is Justin Elsass. I'm the Deputy Director for City Staff. Uh, I'm in the Mayor's Office of Performance and Innovation. Um, we're kind of a recently formed office with the new um, uh, administration that came in. Um, previously, City Staff and the Innovation Team, we're talking to later, we're kind of separate teams, we sit on the same floor, so we just decided to kind of merge with the new administration. Um, I'm also joined by uh, my colleague, Pablo Lima, who's with the Department of General Services. Um, he's going to run you through a little bit later, kind of, you know, what they're doing with the Department of General Services and involves data and automation. Um, I'm going to start by kind of walking you through, though, a, kind of a high level of how city government kind of uses data. I want to be clear, though, and I don't speak for every agency, um, but I'll give you an idea of what, what some of the other agencies are doing um, and then what we're doing in our office. Um, so before I started with city government, um, I was kind of working for the federal government uh, by way of a consultant, and uh, I I had this question. So this was several years ago at this point, but like I didn't have a good perception, and you know, full department had a good view of like, what exactly the city, you know, mechanics kind of work look look like. You know, what does the city government actually do? What do the workflows look like? Um, but as data scientists, being one myself, I always had this question, like, what, what are they doing with data? They post this da data on Baltimore, um, so we can see some of that data, but I have no idea how they're actually using it. Like, do they know what this data is trying to tell them? Um, do they have data science expertise? Um, yeah, like, how, how are they using it? Are they, making, are they making more efficient workflows by using the data? How are they using it? Um, so, even before I started government, I actually had started up a, a website called the Training Center where I just started playing around with the open, open Baltimore data. Um, again, because I was curious what that data was saying. I wasn't convinced that anyone was like taking a look at it and trying to do some richer analysis with it. Um, so I just started doing it myself. Um, but I'm here to say that I, I, I get it. Like I, I know that city government is all, isn't always as transparent as it can be about what exactly we're doing. Um, so I'm hoping I can answer this question by the end of the talk. Um, by answering <laughs> these four questions. Um, first, where are all the data people? So city government, I like to say, is an organization of organizations. Um, very complicated. It's just the same as federal government, right? You have the White House and then you have all these federal agencies that are charged with implementing law. Um, what are they doing? So if there are data people in all these different agencies, what exactly are they doing? Um, during that portion, I'll kind of highlight what my office does with data, um, and then Bob will kind of walk through what they're doing um, at the Department of General Services. Um, are we working on any cool problems? So um, I realize there's a lot of data scientists in the room, um, and I'm always interested in what are the kind of more advanced topics that are being covered in, in city governments. Um, it should come as no surprise that like, the local governments are kind of slow on the uptake with, with new technologies um, that has to do with procurement and hiring practices. Um, we're always behind, not just in data, but in all kinds of other technology um, um, areas. So are we working on any cool problems? Are we doing anything that's cutting edge? Or are we always just kind of producing basic stats and blocks? And then how can I help? Um, Hopefully some of you are here with that question. Um, we hear that a lot, being in city government, and I think we probably can do a better job of asking for help and being a little bit more systematic and, and trying to facilitate um, you know, community working with, with the government. Um, so starting with the first question, where are all the data people? So this is our city government. Um, this is pulled out of um, our city's uh, budget document. Um, you know, obviously, the, the, you, the people, um, are at the top. <laughs> um, but you can see there's all these uh, uh, different agencies, and these are just kind of major agencies. There are, I pulled this one chart off of the page, but there are actually two more org charts on the same page that, um, that describe some of the other smaller agencies. Um, so over there at the right, you can see where me and Bawa sit, so I'm in one of the other mayoral offices. Um, and bottles with the Department of General Services. Um, so where are all these data analysts? Where are the people that know something about data in city government? Um, this was one of the first questions that I had when I came into city government. So 
couple of years ago, Bloomberg Philanthropies created this innovation team in the city. I got hired on as the data scientist, and this was my first question when I came to city government, which was, you know, I was going to be the only data scientist on a team of four, and that's one office in the mayor's office, which is not exactly full of STEM-educated folks, right? It's um, a lot of politics and a lot of policy wonks. Um, so where are all the data people in the other agencies? Um, you can see, like, the planning department has GIS experts, um, police have crime analysts, um, BBMR, the um, Bureau of Budget and Management Research, um, which is kind of within that finance department. Um, they have, obviously, budget analysts, but they also recently hired someone who's working on doing a lot more deep dives and a lot more automation around the reporting. Um, so I think in the years to come, you can expect to see kind of better data analysis around the budget and where it's going. Um, obviously, the health department will have folks like epidemiologists, BCIT, who you're all probably familiar with now after our ransomware attack. Um, that's where our chief data officer lives, as well as a lot of database uh, administrators. So, um, to the extent that agencies are pushing data so that other agencies can access them, a lot of that ends up in SQL servers that they both live uh, over at BCIT. Um, and then you've got folks like myself um, and some of the city stat analysts. A lot of the city stat analysts have more like kind of policy backgrounds. Um, uh, as part of the innovation team, you know, data is kind of data science is kind of one of the pillars that is used in the innovation team methodology. I'll get into a little bit into the IT uh, world later on. Um, and then awesome people over at uh, on Bottomless team and general services are are doing a lot around automation, more efficient workflows, um, better reporting, and that sort of thing. Um, all that to say, so like I said, when I came into city government, I had the question of where all these folks are. One of the things we did recently, first of all, Bottle runs a, a Python meetup that brings together city government uh, folks that are interested in learning Python. Um, we also started what I call kind of a center of excellence. So once a month, now, mind you, I have canceled the last couple, but typically once a month, um, all these folks, we basically just get into a room and someone presents what they're working on or, um, you know, highlights new technology we might be interested in or, or we bring, out a, bring in a guest speaker. Um, so trying to build a community around these, all these people that sit in different, you know, silos, which is the typical term you hear here around local government. Um, you may or may not have seen this. Um, this is from Gartner, but this is kind of this data maturity model around organizations and, and where they kind of fit in growing from you know, very basic descriptive analytics all the way to being predictive and prescriptive. Um, when you look, you know, when you think back at, uh, at the chart on the previous page and all those different agencies and the different types of analysts that are in all these different agencies, our agency fall basically anywhere on the spectrum, right? So some agencies, yes, are at descriptive analytics. There are some agencies, and we'll talk a little bit about, about this too, and how you guys might be able to help. There are agencies that either have data and don't know what to do with it, um, or they have a problem that they need fixed, and they don't realize that they have data that, that can help solve the problem. Um, so I would say that you know some of our agencies, in terms of data maturity, or even kind of off of this, they're not even to the point of doing descriptive analytics. Um, but we are, you know, not maybe not quite descriptive, but we're, we're working our way and, and starting to dabble in predictive analytics. Plenty of other cities are, are doing this as well. Um, so I mentioned um, kind of some of these agencies that don't have a lot of data expertise. Um, maybe they don't even realize that they have data that could, could help them solve a problem. We're starting up a new uh, program called the City Data Fellows, and I wanted to highlight this early and often because we're looking for a program manager for this, uh, for this new program. Um, the idea of the City Data Fellows is basically to get kind of junior data analysts out into the agencies and start supporting them and bringing them along kind of on the path, you know, the data journey. Um, the agencies are going to come to us kind of with proposals, um, what they would do with the data analyst, you know, what kind of project they have in mind. We're also going to work with them to develop the right problem statements so that we can ensure they're working on the right task and the right problem for the agency. Um, but we really want to start building more capacity. And so the idea of this program, you know, 
rather than them sitting in the mayor's office and like crunching numbers and then handing them an analysis, these folks will be embedded for four or six months um, in one of the agencies working hand in hand with some of them from one of the agencies to solve a problem. Okay, so um, what are they doing? <laughs> so what are these folks actually doing? I mentioned I'm not going to speak for every agency. You saw kind of maybe some of the other types of analysts that live in some of the other uh, city agencies. I'm going to kind of walk you through um, my office, and you know we're only a couple of months old, um, but it's a combination of existing programs that are already within city government. Um, and I'll kind of tell you a little, a little bit where we're kind of taking it. Um, um, Okay, so Mayor's Office of Performance and Innovation. How many of you have heard of CityStat? Can anyone kind of describe what CityStat is or, or any of the... Yeah. Um, you're bringing together the different uh, stakeholders from city departments to report uh, out on data that they've collected uh, regarding statistics of productivity. It's based on ComStat. Uh, which comes out of uh, BPD, and uh, you may be familiar with the wire, uh, and has been used with varying degrees of effectiveness depending on who you ask? Yes. Yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> um, yeah, it's hard not to bring up the wire when it comes to this. So, if you're familiar with you know, the ComStat from the wire, um, ComStat was from the Baltimore Police Department, and the Baltimore Police Department actually stole it from the New York Police Department. And the idea is, is, yeah, basically managing performance on, on numbers. Um, uh, former Mayor uh, O'Malley was the one that kind of started this program. Um, you'll hear all kinds of stories about, in the old days, how cities that used to function, which was bringing in agency heads and really kind of taking them to the task to the point of confrontation um, about their performance because, you know, these service requests aren't getting closed out on time. Um, uh, the city staff model has kind of evolved and kind of ebbed and flowed with different administrations. Um, I'll kind of describe where we're, we're headed with this in a minute. Um, but all that to say, yes, it's, it's primarily about performance management. management. Um, cities, agencies kind of explaining what their performance is and, and us holding them to account. Um, our model now is shifting more towards let's find ways to help them because different Depending on who you ask, the, the whole like bring an agency head in and beat them up over their numbers isn't exactly sustainable, right? Because like as soon as you start, as soon as you stop looking at that particular problem, like what happens, right? They stop focusing their attention on that problem. So we're trying to partner a little bit more with the agencies to help them understand the problems and see how we can help. The Baltimore Innovation Team um, is uh, we were started up about two years ago. Um, we are funded by Bloomberg Philanthropies. So Bloomberg has started these innovation teams in about 25 different cities, um, a couple in, in Israel, um, Toronto, and the rest of the US. Um, the idea is to focus just on one mayoral kind of priority area at a time. Um, our first focus area was on recruiting and hiring for the Baltimore Police Department. I don't know if anyone's seen kind of recent new marketing campaign or ads um, that was based a lot on the research that we did. Um, the, mayor, the innovation team kind of combines not only data and data science, but also human-centered design. So we do a lot of um, resident interviews and interviews with subject matter experts and eventually synthesize the quantitative and qualitative and figure out what it's trying to tell us um, so we can kind of make better, more sustainable um, programs or policy changes or, or initiatives around that. Um, so a couple of months ago with the new administration, like I mentioned, kind of combined in this mayor's office of performance and innovation. Oh, I'm sorry, this is what we're kind of about now. Um, um, like I mentioned, the city staff model, we're also kind of shifting more towards working with agencies to help them understand their operations. Um, I'll give you an example of this with, with the Department of Public Works and where we're headed with our, our clean staff. Um, Formerly, city staff was focused on single agencies, so bringing in the Department of Transportation to talk about their numbers, and a different meaning bringing in the Department of Public Works to talk about their numbers. Um, we are focused, we are kind of centering our staff um, meetings or initiatives around the three mayoral priorities. 
you know anything about Mayor Young, um, his kind of three main priority areas are, are public safety, um, uh, cleaning the city, and uh, youth. So we are centering kind of our staff and, and our performance management are kind of around those three areas. All right, so police staff. Um, so anyone, like, public safety is obviously a, a pretty big issue um, in the city right now. Has anyone seen any of the, um, the actual sheets that come out of ComStat? Those, those are published online. Um, they're pretty, uh, they're not great in terms of reporting, in terms of data reporting. So they're typically, I want to say like 30 or 40 pages long. And mind you, they have been putting these out in two weeks. 30 or 40 pages long, it's a PDF, and it's, yes, it's something the police department uses themselves, um, but it doesn't, it doesn't communicate what's going on all that well. They do, you know, they'll say lots of, yeah, it's a PDF, which is about all you need to know. <laughs> um, so, not only that, but what I've been working with um, some of our crime analysts on is just better understanding from a data perspective about what's really going on. And my number one issue <laughs> when it comes to um, data in the public safety world, especially because everyone's so focused on homicides, is sample counts. Um, yes, there are way too many homicides taking place in Baltimore. Um, where's Christine? I'm not saying that, there are <laughs> that homicides are low, but from a statistical standpoint, right, you have about 300 a year, um, once, one every day almost, maybe less than that. Um, that's not a whole lot to understand, you know, within the last week, within the last two weeks, are we doing any better or aren't we? Just because the, the samples are so low, right? So we're trying to, this is all about data literacy and bringing out along the police, uh, police department as well as some, you know, the city staff program and just better data visualization and better kind of fundamental understanding of, of um, performance. We can't do this on a day-to-day -day or a week-to-week -week basis. The ones and twos and zeros and threes just don't tell us enough. Um, you know, we're moving to things like rolling 90-day totals. Um, we're trying to look back over the different years and find um, different patterns going on. So, of course, you know, you see the heat map of homicides and shootings um, and kind of, you know, what times, of, like, of course, homicides and shootings take place in the evenings. Um, there's a couple of you know recent insights we brought about. So one is it's kind of curious. And I, to be honest, I haven't even tested this for statistics really. But um, you see on Monday nights at like 11 p.m. and Tuesday nights at around I think it was 7 p.m. or so. There's kind of a you can see they're a little bit brighter green. Um, for whatever reason, there just seemed to be over the last couple of years more homicides um, those evenings. Um, Again, that may, not, may or may not be significant, but this is the kind of reporting we kind of haven't been producing in city stat until now. Um, so I think we're kind of headed in a direction that we're trying to make better sense of the data that we do have. So that we can understand that a little bit better. Sure. First of all, um, homicides only include homicides by shooting? No, so, so homicides are any homicides, and these are non fatal shootings. Um, typically, we do only fill It can't be if you say 300, because I have a lot more. So homicides and non-fatal shootings, right. So non-fatal shootings, there are, this is a rough approximation, there's typically around like two to three non-fatal shootings for every homicide. Mm -hmm. So just roughly around magnitude. And so homicides, would you ridiculous homicides also? Stay uh, stay well, by definition, yes, but when it comes to um, kind of the police analysis, usually we're only looking at homicides by firearm or yeah, homicides that are so if, no, if these sure. numbers when we add them all up, I suspect there's a heck of a lot bigger than 300 times three years. And so does that include a shooting? It is, that's what I'm saying. So homicides plus shootings, this is homicide plus non yeah. so, so is there a shooting that's reported where there's no victim included? <coughs> shooting where Someone shoots a gun, yeah. right? Someone reports it to the police. The police investigates. Yes, there's been a shooting. There's um, one, no one's been shot at. They'll investigate, but this is incident based, or I'm sorry, victim based. Okay. Um, yeah, so, yeah. Any other questions? I should have mentioned, like, I'm happy to take questions if we go wrong. So, so, what happens when, when what we know about Baltimore City is 
today. When we start to geolocate these shoemakers, we start to know where they are, right? So they're, they're tied to, to variables that were very well acute and understand. So is there a way for us to see those? Sorry, what do you mean? So can we see data by place? Right, because what we do oh, about Baltimore sure. City, yeah. as it relates to police stats, place is the most significant yes. variable, not non-fatal shootings. Well, non-fatal shootings and homicides all have locations, and yeah, we know exactly where hot spots are. All, by the way, all of this data. So this is another move we're making in cities that we're by default we're using the data that's on Open Baltimore. Everyone knows about Open Baltimore. Right? Um, uh, open Baltimore, data.baltimorecity.gov, that's where we post a lot of Open Baltimore, or Open Data. Um, all of the data that you're seeing in these plots is Open Data, um, which is what kind of enables me to come here and share some stuff. It's because I can always say, yeah, but it was already public, so what's the problem? Um, uh, but back to geography, yeah, of, of, of course, these are, I mean, there are very specific areas where um, homicides and shootings are taking place. Again, like because we know in general, like the, the more granular you get, and the, you know, the harder it is to say what's going to occur there over the next month or two. Um, there are predictive policing tools. We're not using them, to my knowledge. Most of the police department's doing something I don't know about. Um, that would be good. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, but yeah, I mean, we typically, yeah, we. Kind of know where I mean it's Park Heights, it's East Baltimore, it's West Baltimore. Um, Sandtown is yeah, of course it's a hot spot. Yeah, um, uh, yeah. I didn't I didn't include any maps, but yeah, that's important. Um, one of the other areas where um, you know I kind of mentioned where we're stat what we're statting nowadays. Uh, we've also launched Clean Stat. This is only about a month old. Police Stat has kind of always gone on. And yes, it's kind of bad to implode. And, They've reported on different things and, and um, highlighted different things. CleanStat, there was a version of CleanStat from what I understand a number of years ago. Um, we are restarting that because cleaning the city is, is another mayoral priority and not only mayoral priority, a lot of residents are really concerned with the amount of trash and illegal dumping that takes place. Um, there are so this involves multi-agencies, right? So the Department of Public Works, the Housing Department, um, Department of Transportation to a lesser extent, but primarily Housing and Department of Public Works. Um, because of some of their workflows and operations and because of, frankly, because of former iterations of city stat, I think everyone comes into the new city stat meetings like this with the six stars. Um, they've come to city stat meetings in the past. Um, and you know, maybe they've gotten beaten up about their performance. Um, a lot of people that are still in city government from those previous days have come in and they're clearly either defensive or they've done a really, really good job of preparing to come to the meeting. Um, you can kind of tell that they've been through this stuff before and they're not sure what to anticipate. Um, what we're trying to do is, is, one, yes, bring them back into the room together, Housing and Department of Public Works, because their workflows are tied. So when you put in a legal dumping service request, um, you put in a legal dumping service request, the first thing that happens is a housing inspector goes to that site to take a look to see if there's any materials or information on that site um, that they could hold someone to account, that they could cite someone or they could you know, prosecute for, for legal dumping. What happens after this is I'll acknowledge is extremely frustrating. So after housing finishes that quick inspection, they close the original service request. And as of right now, what happens is you, the resident, gets a, a notice that the service request has been closed out. Um, we're working to change, at the very least, change the, the, the messaging that you receive when, when it gets closed, because the work hasn't been done. And it's incredibly frustrating for someone to see a closed notice, and then they walk out the door and the garbage bags are still there. Um, the Department of Public Works has a huge backlog in terms of, of, of clean. Um, in any case, so getting those two in the room, the Housing and the Department of Public Works has been really important. Um, 
um, kind of one way we're kind of facilitating that is trying to big, bring new <coughs> insights instead of just beating them up about the poor performance and the fact that the city isn't clean and we've got this many overdue SRs. Um, yes, we're frustrated with that, but we're also trying to bring them along and help them understand what the data is telling them a little bit better because they don't have data scientists and data analysts in house. One of the public works, you know, I mentioned earlier how every agency is on a little bit different path in terms of maturity. Department of Public Works is, a, I would say, a little bit behind the curve. Um, so we're trying to bring some new insight so that we can get these people talking again and maybe develop some new strategies. On the right there, you see um, not just looking at service requests, but there's a separate, there's actually two separate um, work order management systems. So beyond just service requests, um, there are also internal work orders that get created um, to drive these, these you know, cleaning activities or inspection activities. So we kind of joined up those data sets to find where work orders and service request reporting overlaps that helped us kind of identify better hotspots. So right now, um, this spot up in Park Heights is an area where we're basically working with, with these two agencies to come up with like a better, we're gonna, see, we're gonna use this kind of as like a pilot or test ground to test out some new strategies um, as far as planning goes. Yeah, real quick. Yeah, sure. Um, I just noticed that can't put it on a sticker. Um, the way they lower the stack of trucks yeah. is problematic. So the okay. first truck came down the aisle and said, oh, that's not all my load, it's all the next truck. Right, so so how it gets stacked and reassembled uh, might be some Yeah, um, I mentioned kind of data maturity and uh, Department of Public Works. We would love to dig more into the operations and either optimize of, of routes or staffing or scheduling, they don't have great operations data. Um, we're going to work with them to stand up better data capture mechanisms in the first place so that we can get better data from the crews um, about how long it took certain routes and how much trash they actually picked up on that route um, so that we can do a better job of things like that um, and identifying those, those problem areas. Um, it's just right now um, we don't have the right operational data from the agency to do that. Um, What's the city strategy in terms of working with nonprofit organizations also? If we know that you're doing a cleanup on Monday <clears throat> and we do a volunteer project and clean up on Tuesday, is that being organized at all? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you heard of Be More Beautiful? Um, so Be More Beautiful um, is, uh, I think it's over in the environmental <laughs> I think it's you know, uh, uh, Rebecca Woods um, from the Environmental Control Board. Um, they they are organizing. I think Be More Beautiful is, is probably that conduit. Um, as part of Clean Step, um, one thing we're really excited about is you know I talked about this merger of city staff and innovation. And one thing we're really excited about is bringing human centered design into performance management. Um, and, and the, the, you know what this data is telling us. Like maybe we'll go and interview residents out there and, and try to create more meaning on exactly what's going on there. Um, um, where was I headed with that? Oh, community um, um, collaboration. So both sides are actually asking for that. So when we talked to the Department of Public Works and the Housing Department, they're begging to like for community help and like understanding where the problem areas are and. Not only that, but there's a little bit of behavior um, change too. That I mean, I've seen people throw like styrofoam containers full of food like out their car window. Um, so there's, I think both sides are basically asking for that. And like I said, Cleanstead is basically a month old, and part of what we're bringing from the innovation team side over to these stat models is to not jump at conclusions. And to make sure we understand the problems a little bit better, make sure we understand what the data is telling us a bit better before we jump into, okay, let's start throwing community, like let's make sure community gets over here, or um, yeah, let's scrap DPW scheduling and routes and like try this whole other thing. Like I said, it's only a month old. We want to understand kind of root causes a little bit better, but no matter what those problems actually look like, I am positive that some kind of community involvement and, and better kind of engagement or, or um, some kind of better workflow between community and, and uh, the city is going to come out of it. Yeah. How are you getting the, uh, like the locations of the trash? Like, is it, a, is it like an app you can download on your phone? Or? 
Oh, does everyone have a through one app? Can you repeat the questions? Yeah, sorry. The question was, um, how do you get the locations of, of trash? Um, everyone should pull up their phones and download the, the Baltimore 311 app. Um, 311 is our system for reporting basically any problem you see out there <laughs> that the city might be responsible for, whether it's illegal dumping, potholes, um, a tree is down, fire heart hydrant is broken and leaking. Um, I mean, that data, that's one probably our richest and most important data set is that service request data because that tells us where the problems are. Um, so yeah, if you don't have that app, please download it and start. Uh, DPW is going to be coming for telling people that it's an important service request. <laughs> stories about, you know, such and such city has so many rats in this area, but then the, the pushback has been that with the 311 apps, what they're really reporting on is not the level of trash, it's the level of citizens who feel empowered to report trash, which the criticism is, is that that's mostly going to be white people or, you know, non-minorities, people who feel like if I make a fuss, somebody's going to listen. Um, and how, how do you yeah. feel, does that... You know, yeah, so your data, or how do you try to correct that? Yeah, for everyone one data, I mean, there have been studies about how biased through one data can be because of exactly that. Um, that certain people are more likely to submit a service request. Um, we are building in better, basically, equity measures in, in all of these stacking. So we want to understand the neighborhood level um, and kind of by ethnicity, um, by income levels, if we're providing the same service. And it's not always are we closing out the same number of, of, of service requests? Um, we want to see that service in terms of like on-time delivery is equitable across the city, that we're not leaving certain portions of the city out. Um, oops. <coughs> um, but, uh, yeah, so that, that's going to come up time and time again. And like I said, we're, we're trying to build that in as a principle of, of a lot of our um, analysis going forward. Um, we're trying to make it more explicit um, in the analysis. You're totally right, though. It's always biased. But on the other hand, um, 3 in 1 isn't just an app. 3 in 1, before there was an app, it was, it was by phone. Um, there are plenty of residents in every neighborhood that make phone calls still. Um, in fact, if I remember right, I think phone calls still account for the could be totally wrong about this, so don't quote me. But I think phone calls may still make up a majority of service requests. I'm not positive about that. All that to say, like, for anyone has been around a while, and a lot of residents that are super active and super involved, no matter what neighborhood you're in, are at least using the phone. Could I ask you a question? Sure. Because um, you talked about having coverage to be able to release this because it's a open source, right? Sure. So how are you thinking about civil society aggregators and operators that are thinking here about fight like that, you know, give the blues to the city, right? But we yeah. need to be able to cover necessary if they're properly partnered with, right, to, to, to then be able to, to, to do the work that you need to do that you otherwise wouldn't be able to do. Civil society, if civil society is not strong, the government can't do it. And so how are you thinking about the data that's coming from that side of the house to get an influence on some of the things that you know you need to do? So, so I think the question is how how do we bring along data that's coming from kind of outside sources or outside collectors or outside kind of nonprofits or agencies? Yeah, so society players that are aggregating data that are pushing against the city. Yeah, and, and can create cover that otherwise we don't have. Yeah, I think um, so. One example of this, and we haven't really pursued it, I'll admit. Um, a good example would be on housing. I'm actually, can I save that question um, for later because I'm going to get into um, some housing work that we've started up, um, which might be a little more interesting in terms of data science for everyone. Um, so I'll save that question because uh, it's pertinent for the, for the housing work. Um, uh, but now I'm going to pass it over to Bob to kind of explain what's going on in the Department of General Services. With the if I don't, let me forget about your question. <laughs> All right, so I want to speak briefly to um, I think our, our workspace is slightly, slightly different from uh, Justin's and agencies that he works with because um, we are not external facing. We don't, the Department of General Services does not provide 
services to public residents. So DGS is responsible for the management of the vertical and mobile assets of the city, of the fuel tank, the fuel stations and, and tanks, um, essentially all the services that other agencies uh, need to complete their missions, we provide to them. So um, our clients are generally other city agencies. And so I'll speak about sort of the three core focus areas of our office and sort of how each of our activities derive from one of these areas and speak briefly about some examples of how we're using, uh, sort of what we're focused on, uh, some projects that we've worked on that try to increase the amount of automation in the agency, um, and then sort of how we're using data to try to drive decision making, decision making and then policy in our agency and opportunities to find ways to change policy citywide. And so uh, these are sort of the three core areas. One uh, project that we're focused on is trying to completely eliminate the agency dependency on paper by 2024. So we're probably a year and a half into this project. Um, we're at a place now where we have uh, procured sort of web-based drag and drop workflow uh, automation software that allows us to sort of build workflows, um, sort of identify what the business logic is, uh, transactions, and graph that logic to those workflows. Um, and use that as a way to sort of document the work that happens in the agencies because we have, we're an agency of roughly 350 people, the Department of Services, but 60% of our staff is retirement ready for retirement eligible. So we definitely need to document the work. Um, but if we go into the office and say, we need to know what you do because you know you're not going to be here in four years, and that's not going to work. So um, we, we've been very lucky that sort of people have bought into the idea that like, if I can work with this group to sort of automate my process and make it paperless, it makes my life easier. So we communicate to the agency about stealing time and giving it back to the worker. And so we don't really care about a lot of new hires or analysts assets. Like, so what are you going to do? How, are you measuring the time that you save? Right? But we're not, we don't care about that. I don't, I don't care if you watch cat videos. Right? Like, we're not measuring that. What we're trying to do right now is sort of get folks to become early stakeholders so they can help us identify those next, we have a roadmap, right? How do we get them to identify the next sort of processes that we put into the roadmap? Uh, so that's, and we have built uh, eight, we have built and deployed eight workflows. We have two that are in um, development now, and one of those workflows, I should say, is for uh, human resources. It's something that covers like 11 separate uh, transactions. So some of the early workflows that we deployed sort of high volume work across the agency. So the long-term goal here is to, um, so this is, I was telling Justin earlier today, I often don't like it when someone else tells the mayor's office or another agency they were working on something, because it slows things down. Because people want to say, what are you doing, what are you working on, come show us. Um, <laughs> so what we've been trying to do with this project is um, use our agency, because we're sort of insulated, because we don't provide sort of direct public services, to identify what the level of effort is to arrive at a paperless state. Sort of system agnostic, what is the level of effort? And like, what do we need to do to communicate how this would look if the city wanted to do something? And so that's sort of, uh, sort of where we are. Um, the other piece sort of related to the group here that's, that's relevant is we've been sort of designing workflows and processes uh, with the notion in mind that we, there's questions that we want to answer, there's operational changes that we want to make, and that we need to build workflows that capture the data so that we can answer the future questions and use that to drive, use that to sort of be the engine of the continuous process improvement. So there's been some examples where we design a workflow, um, we assess the data from sort of how the transaction happened, and then we say, well, actually, uh, for hiring or position reclassification or for salary adjustments, the director usually takes only you know, 45 minutes to approve, which that really means, after we sort of conduct interviews with him, was that I pay a lot of people a lot of money to make these decisions. By the time this shit hits me, I don't need to, like, I'm just approved, right? So we say, okay, well, based on that, we want to reduce the number of people that are in this transaction. So we, we sort of use that to sort of drive uh, improvement and sort of reduce the amount of time. Uh, just for clarity, your department is working on going papers for all the other No, so that's a good question. The Department of General Services, the core divisions are fleet management, 
We're responsible for the, the mobile assets. So any class of vehicles, street sweepers, dumpsters, load packers, haulers, boats. Um, if it's a vehicle, we're responsible for it. Uh, the vertical assets, the buildings. If it's a class of building, we're responsible for it. We're also responsible for the decommissioned school buildings. So that's another challenge we have. We can't always predict um, what, we don't get to say, hey, we want it. I'm an asset manager and I want these assets in my portfolio. We don't, we don't have that luxury. School, de school system, not to talk bad about school system, if anyone here from the school system. Um, imagine you work for the school system, you have limited capital dollars, and you know that in five years this building is going to be decommissioned. Are you going to make the capital replacements that you need to, to maintain a high FCI for that building? Probably not, because somebody's going to inherit that. Um, so that's a, um, so that there's a lot of, to your earlier question, there's a lot of uh, processes and transactions between the agencies, fleet management, facilities management division, capital products division, administration, and what we're focused on is eliminating the dependency on paper, all of the internal transactions. Now we recognize that like along the way, there are processes that we've sort of built out where to complete a process, agency X or agency Y needs to receive some package or some output from us. So we have folks that are sort of building um, workflows that sort of trigger some sort of dynamic notification or the sort of sending of that package to that next sort of approval or that next person in the process. And so we're working like, to identify which of those stakeholders it makes sense to issue a next round of licenses to sort of bring into this full workflow. So we talk a lot in the agency about like, we processes the A to Z, we control A to J. So we want to automate A to J and then sort of work J to Z. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Um, so that's the paperwork piece. Um, task automation, we, so one of the things that we're sort of focused on here is that there's not a, there's not really a, li a shared language for process improvement in the city. Um, and, and we're convinced that that language, like we need a lingua franca for process improvement. So we're convinced in the agency that Python can be that sort of lingua franca for process improvement because it's a low barrier to entry, what broad community, extensible, super flexible language, do all these other things. Um, so a lot of, so, one piece of that sort of focus here is we have invested a lot of time to build a practical ecosystem. We sort of uh, conscientious about the training and the types of tools that we want to focus on to sort of fix problems. Where we say, hey, like there's a wide menu, but like we want you to see this hammer, and we want you to see almost every problem in there. Um, there's some pros and cons to that, but we, we're sort of at a stage where we're trying to build an ecosystem where we can have technical and non-technical people have easier communication with one another about how to identify problems. Um, and so as part of this, there's a lot of effort to identify problems and give people the skills to identify like business problems um, to bring to us to help automate. So these are anything from, and I'll speak to some, some of these now. Some of them are like um, relatively you know, complex things, some of them are light and funny. Um, and so I'll sort of speak to just like a range of a few examples, um, and if there's questions, we can sort of go on the implementation of those. But this is driven at identifying those repetitive, manual, administrative, or analysis tasks that happen on a regular basis. How do we identify those, document those, and automate those people in the agency? And then the last uh, core area is what we're calling the extension project. This is, I'd say over the last uh, year, year and a half, we've been trying to build a programmatic framework for, so we've been working with the different agencies, chiefs, sort of internal, the divisions, uh, supervisors to identify business problems, operational problems, data related problems, sort of keeping those in our own internal database and prioritizing those to determine uh, which of those we want to invest our own time and energy in to develop a coherent problem statement. And then build, building a pipeline to regional academic institutions where we can sort of work with uh, sort of target faculty, uh, academic institutions or capstones, uh, nonprofit startups, et cetera, the sort of wheel that we sort of envision to leverage that sort of capacity to help us increase our ability to solve problems and implement solutions. So that's sort of third piece. And so some of these sort of interact, but all the activities that we're engaging in the office uh, are sort of derived from one of these three core areas. Any sort of questions about that? Besides going paperless, how are we addressing standardization so that across for instance forms so that like one agency says first name, middle initial, last name, and then another form and another agency says you know, first name, middle name, 
last name, and like that they all have these sort of different forms. Is that being addressed under this paper list? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. So um, one of the this actually was was it was an item in the requirements maybe like two years ago when we were working to identify like what system that we wanted to work with. So one of the there were sort of features of the the software tool that we use, it allows you to it allows us to build um, workflows in a way that um, think of the workflow as an object. And this workflow has this object has a bunch of different properties. So like one property might be Another property may be the input field in that form. Another property may be the transactions that happen on that form. So like all that is stored, we want to export that. It's all stored into sort of like JSON notation, right? And we can sort of port to another agency. So we've had a number of conversations with the Department of Human Resources about, um, so we demoed to a number of agencies like the workflows we deploy, and we said, when you are at the point where you want to take on office supplies, computer supply purchases, um, hiring, onboarding, um, termination, whichever of these processes that you want to identify, like we will port for you this process so that there is one way to hire somebody across all the agencies. So it allows us to use, to leverage our research as sort of a standard operating procedure to sort of pass the other agencies. Does that answer your question? Create another part of this, like, um Kind of sits with our chief data officer over at BCIT, and we do need better data standardization beyond just. Well, that's a broader question. I was only speaking to the small yeah, yeah, small yeah. 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 I, yeah, I get what you're saying. So, like names and also like geocoding, so how addresses um, are listed, like those are the two obvious ones where we need better standardization. I know our chief data officer in BCIT, or he's relatively new, our chief data officer, but data governance is like one of his big. I mean, I think that's kind of his first priority. Um, and that ought to be part of it, yeah. So imagine for a second that like these bullets weren't all here. They just like flew in one by one or like bounced across individually. Like imagine I have more time and they just like, just like came in one at a time. So I'm gonna ask you to focus one bullet at a time. Um, so I'm gonna sort of briefly go through a few examples to sort of give and we sort of talked about this. I think Jason's going to adjust this and go deep. I'm going to sort of go broad to give you a flavor of like how we're sort of implementing and using these things in, in our agency. Um, so the, one of the things that we did, yes, um, was uh, so the city moved to this like outcome-based budget process where they ask you every year to sort of report on your like key for each service, your key sort of performance uh, measures. And so one thing that we wanted to do was <coughs> eliminate the sort of Excel spreadsheet soup where you have all these people who are in different spreadsheets and different calculations, or like from one fiscal year to the next, you can't really identify like, okay, like where is the, the raw data from this? Like how do I like verify, validate that this number's the same? Um, so one of the things that we did was we uh, sort of executed a project to create a series of notebooks and sort of write very well-documented scripts that produce, um, that sort of point to the data uh, and sort of recreate the measure and also the charts um, and sort of timestamp, so you can sort of go back. So in that way, we sort of documented, uh, and I wouldn't say fully automated, because there's still a portion where you need to like call the data, right? There's, we didn't build a data pipeline for it, but to the extent you ingest new data, you can sort of automate the process of creating um, your performance measures here. Uh, so did you do notebooks? Did you do notebooks? Yes, we, we did it in the new Jupyter notebooks. Um, so that, that was one project. Uh, another is we had a large, there's another uh, analyst in the office, uh, Melanie, that spent a lot of time working on the project. So we have, um, we, we were trying to understand better energy consumption at a building level, but the way that we were getting bills from BGE for energy just like didn't make any sense with like how our, um, like how we identify locations and block and lot. Um, and so we needed to um, basically build a uh, tool that would allow us to sort of ingest the data, the reports that we would get from BGE, &E and use um, sort of the geolocators that we had in a couple of different data sets for our buildings to sort of overlay and figure out which, like what percentage of um, water meters that we've been billed for are actually associated for buildings that are within our boundaries so that we can identify what percentage of bills are inappropriate. 
Um, so this was a this was a sort of a fairly um, large uh, project and really really sort of helped with us. Um, another one, this is one of the fun ones. Oh. You might want to talk for that conversation. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I think I talked a lot. Sorry. <laughs> okay, yeah. So I'll just play the conversation. Um, so this is the project that we did to, um, we, we were interested in, we wanted to know, is like how are we as an agency with in terms of uh, compensation there, is there anyone in the agency that's been unfairly compensated? So like, we tried to define that. So we, we knew that we wanted to answer this question like today, but also in the future as we make new hires, as people leave, as sort of the expanding track. And so we sort of define this by like, is there anyone, uh, are there any people working in the agency that are in the same position, given who have similar hire dates within a set threshold, uh, that have significantly different uh, salaries. Like, how do we identify those people, and what do we do actually need to say? Um, and so this, um, this is just like some of the um, graphs that we use to communicate like the uh, policy recommendations that we wanted to see. So. I guess the main points that came out of that were there's a huge, there's historic, so the, the disparity that we have in the number of women in the agency and across the divisions is driven by the fact that, like there's a lot of technician work and also the fact that like historically, just like early on in the agency, we hired men more. So we were hiring men historically for all these like uh, technician manual labor jobs and we started hiring women for some of the same roles very late. Um, but also that's compounded by the fact that like those guys had many more years of like uh, COLA adjustments and some compounding increases. Um, so we had to sort of factor for that and we looked at like which of the people actually are in similar positions um, that, that we need to address. So um, moving here, this is sort of a snapshot of like us identifying in all this like list of like massive positions. And this was a challenge because like we couldn't get all of the position classifications that we needed from HR for whatever reason. So we had to build a script to scrape the public ones on the site <laughs> to bring them over in and then sort of run this over. So asking why we can talk to the rest or whatever. Um, well, so this is us sort of identifying those instances of positions and classes where we were like, okay, yeah, you, we rub the names, but like we can tell you who these people are and we need to address, take some action to address compensation in these sort of classes. Um, so this is something that we built so that moving forward, we could sort of always keep a pulse on um, how we are as an agency. It's something we talked about sort of sharing with other agencies, like we haven't yet, we probably should. Um, I feel like the last of all, we probably should. Um, uh, so I'll also speak to this also. Um, these are just some examples of, so that first one was uh, examples of things that we try to do to sort of save administrative time. These are examples of things that we've done to sort of change uh, operation, change operations. And so the first one, so let's jump, jump to these. Uh, this one I think is real. I'll speak maybe just to this one. Um, so is anyone familiar with what, what the change order is? How change orders work? Yeah, yeah. Um, the other government guy. Yeah. So, <laughs> This, this gentleman here, Cole, he, he, we used to work together. So he actually worked, uh, actually two of these things that he, he sort of worked on and um, made a significant dent in helping us sort of think through these, these issues. So essentially, a change order is if, uh, so we manage facilities, right? So there's subs roofing, doors, you know, blocks, whatever. If uh, you're a vendor and I say, hey, like, this doesn't work, in order for me, for me to work with you, even if you're a contract, I need to request a quote from you. You give me a quote, you say, hey, like, this is going to cost you hundred dollars. You give me a quote. I'll say, okay, based on this quote, I approve you do the work. You do the work, then you send me an invoice. Then my guys, our guys, check to see if the work is done, or women check to see if the work is done. And if your invoice is less than a quote, we don't have a problem. You get paid. If it matches the quote, we don't have a problem. You get paid. If you invoice me for one hundred and one dollars, now we have an administrative problem. Someone needs to write a change order. And so we were. So this problem sort of stemmed from we were trying to figure out like why, the original question was like, why are we spending so much money on contract work? And it was derived from the fact that like there were so, the pool of people bidding on our contracts was small because of the amount of time it took us to pay 
vendors, therefore the pool was smaller, so like the prices were higher. So we said, okay, well, we need to do something to drop down the amount of time it takes to pay a vendor. So we realized that like one significant factor was the number of change orders. And so there were change orders that, um, long story short, five people in the approval path, they all are, you know, 50 to 40 to 70 to 100 dollars an hour people in exchange for 20 bucks, like the math didn't make sense. Uh, so we performed an analysis on like what should happen and what the threshold should be, and so we sort of uh, introduced a citywide policy to um, create a sort of contingency for normal business practices that other agencies use. So that's sort of one example of like how we were using analysis to sort of drive uh, operational sort of processes. So how fast? So we, we still try to hit 30 days. We don't always hit 30 days, but we're using between 30 and 42. Um, but that, that, that measures, um, this is sort of an unfair answer. That is when we get it. Uh, so that like the processing time within the agency, the challenge remains is that like DGS or any agency doesn't control the amount of time it takes the bureau, the other bureaus that need to sort of uh, execute the checks because they have that, they can wait 30 days to issue payment once it's been approved by the agency. So you're like at 60 to 90 days, okay? Yeah, it could, it could take you 31 days, it could take you 60. Or 90. Or 90. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> but 60 is better than 120. <laughs> The, the process, the part of the process that didn't change was that the supervisor who was responsible for windows, when he works with the vendor to say, hey, I need a window quote, that supervisor is responsible for assessing the validity of that quote. So if you send him, him or her a quote for $670 to fix a window that last year cost $420, like that supervisor should say, this quote doesn't make any sense. I'm, like, give me a new quote. Um, one thing, one argument that we made was like, okay, finance people, isn't it suspicious to you if my vehicle breaks down in the middle of the highway and I pick up the phone and I call a mechanic and say, I'm going to describe to you over the phone, like, what's wrong with my car? And they say, yeah, that's going to cost you $6,430.26. That doesn't make any sense. But that's essentially what was that? We were incentivized to get anyway, so. Uh, that, that was the argument that we made. I'm sort of being a devil's advocate. I know we need to show you. I have a question on that. When, so you said like when the outcome was just increasing the amount of vendors, like bidding on the quotes, strategy costs. After that happened, like that not, happened. Yet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> not yet. Not yet. Yeah, and it takes. It's. I think it will take more time to convince smaller vendors that it's safe to work with the city. But if you're if you're a big boy, you can withstand not receive a payment for like six or seven months, but you probably bake that into your bid. Um, so uh, somebody asked, which is why it was important for us to drive down the amount of time it takes to close the work with, I mean, to, to pay them. Um, someone asked earlier uh, if there's ways to partner. One of the things that we're doing that relates to the sort of extension project is we started to farm out uh, projects that we sort of got to a ready enough extent to uh, external partners. We've worked with a couple different universities. This is sort of one project that we want to highlight that we do with Kearney Mellon. We sort of asked them, um, hey, we have all this like uh, work order maintenance data for how we manage our buildings. Um, we put it here, I'm not going to click on this, but we use this data.world service to sort of share um, a sort of complete data project with the data dictionary and all this stuff associated with the project. And we said, basically, tell us what we would need, like walk us through uh, the implementation plan of like what we need to do if we wanted to be able to answer questions in a way that like manage, help us incorporate the probability of failure of vertical assets into how we do long-term capital planning. Um, and so that's a, there was a lot of work that went into that project and this is one that like we, I think, really benefited from having that partnership. And it's a way that we sort of look to partner um, with sort of folks uh, externally that have an interest in working on city problems, working on city data, etc. 
So I know we're over time, but if you guys are interested, feel free to be in the feedings too. But uh, I'll walk through kind of a more, like, a little bit deeper of a um, uh, data science, science problem. I'm only going to spend a couple of minutes on it. Um, uh, yeah. So right now, the housing department, um, th this work came about so earlier in the year, the innovation team started work on um, in, in, in the housing space, um, part of the previous administration. The innovation team right now is trying to suss out what the next priority area is going to be because we have a new administration. We started working with the housing department, though, and they have this key question, which is, we, and this gets back to the question of like, how are you using kind of community data around like, you know, bringing community data into the fold. Um, housing department only knows about buildings that are vacant because they issued a vacant building notice. A vacant building notice means that building has already had code violations and it's probably been uninhabited for a while. And it's deteriorated to the point where it's no longer habitable. So for someone to even occupy the house again, they're gonna have to do some work and come back to the housing department and prove that it's habitable. So that point, once it's issued a vacant building notice, it becomes more costly to deal with. Eventually, it might end up on the burden of the city anyways because we acquire it. Um, if we knew in advance that a house had been abandoned, that someone had left, maybe an elderly person passed away, um, maybe someone, like, maybe the furnace failed, that was the last straw, the person was living paycheck to paycheck, couldn't afford the furnace, left to go live with a family member, and now the house is abandoned. If we knew those houses were unoccupied, we could intervene sooner. We could do something about it a lot sooner and prevent costs down the road. So this is what we're familiar with in terms of abandoned housing, right? So um, you, we, for the most, you know, when you see the board up, so we know where this stuff is. There's no question of whether this is abandoned. These all have vacant building notices. Um, we get service requests when these things are no longer boarded if they're open. Housing department comes back and boards them up again. This is this is what I'm talking about. So this is up in Bel Air, Edison. You can't tell which of these buildings is unoccupied or abandoned, right? Um, I can't tell either. Um, I'm not gonna, like, I don't. I literally don't know. <laughs> um, but there are. We know there are our houses in areas like Bel Air, Edison, and some of our lower middle neighborhood um, areas. So like the Bel Air, Edison's and. Um, um, even the Curtis Bays, um, you know, there's there's turnover and there's abandonment that we, we just aren't seeing until it's far too late to do anything about. Um, I already kind of covered this. Vacant is well, you know, one of the building notice. Um, this is all all this to say, like we could intervene sooner and might feel a little bit cheaper. We don't need to go there. I can't explain that. So what do we want to do? We want to identify buildings that have been abandoned. That people have moved out of. Um, we started working with, so Johns Hopkins University um, uh, folks is actually was in the astrophysics department. Um, it was a center I I I'm not gonna remember what it stands for, but we started work with them um, basically on a specific problem. So how do we know if a building is abandoned? What what indicators are there that we can get access to that'll tell us if this if a building's been left or not? Um, so uh, there's a couple of things that go into this. So first of all, up in the upper right hand corner, um, that actually that upper right hand corner is kind of would be kind of the primary management. We'd like to be able to do that um, right away, but we know that we've actually had issues <laughs> for whatever reason with procuring the right external data. Um, there are direct mailing services that you can literally buy data that says if a building is potential bigger or not. Um, Water usage data lives in DPW, and we've been a little bit sensitive about showing that data, but those are probably the two most important indicators where we can see pretty readily. Even, it could even be without predictive analytics. This could be like a heuristic, right? Like if we see for one month that water usage is below a certain threshold that it's likely to be um, unoccupied. So that would actually be kind of the core of the model. But there's this other piece of it that we think could, could be kind of a sub-problem or a sub-classification problem feed into it. Um, for the last two summers, housing department has had youth works uh, kids. So these are like high schoolers and I think up to 21. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so so they, they um, look um, at our at our pictometry. 
for houses, you know, they do these flyovers every year, so the youth workers kind of look at the pictometry and find houses that they think that might have roof issues, and then they've gone out into the field and tried to confirm whether there are roof issues or not. So that can potentially form a training set on what houses uh, have rooftop issues, right? Um, so if we could train up a model, you know, we've got this huge mosaic um, image of the entire city. Um, I think it's down to like a, it's pretty high resolution. <laughs> okay. um, we use kind of the parcel geometry, um, block and lots, to kind of break it up into individual parcels, and then develop and basically train up a model to uh, um, an image supply supplier to say, like, well, you think this rooftop is bad, you think this one's in any good condition. Um, that kind of sub problem could also help in terms of predicting whether a building is occupied. Because there are even buildings out there that, so not only like would we like to be able to get it like within a pretty early time frame of when someone leaves the house, there are even houses out there that are borderline that are like getting to this state that we have an issue with vacant building notice because we don't know about that. So there could be buildings out there that look kind of similar to this that have roof issues um, that are deteriorating that if we can slap a vacant building notice on it, that gives the city more authority to do something about um, So that's kind of partly why we're interested in developing both this rooftop kind of sub-model as well as the, the core model that would come predict whether a building is on or not. This, this work has been on pause for the moment because like I said, the housing um, We've kind of moved off housing. We're going to keep working on this, and this is actually another point for me to make a plug. Um, I want to bring in a new data science intern to focus solely on this problem. Um, we committed to the housing department that even though we're moving off the housing work we were originally tasked with, we, we still want to help develop this. Um, we still have commitment from Johns Hopkins, but it needs some attention on the city side, and it needs like day in and day out focus that we currently don't have the capacity for. So if you know anyone, uh, any grad students looking for kind of a, an internship, please let me know. Um, it would be a really great you, problem to have here. How will I even bring somebody in? Sorry, what was that? How quickly can you bring somebody in? How quickly can we bring someone in? Um, our office is what we call, so our, we're non civil service, so we're exempt, which means that we kind of have the same kind of hiring, like lateral discretion that most other organizations kind of do. Uh, we currently I'm already hiring for um, you know, the program manager and the data developer. We don't, yeah, we don't do unpaid graduate. They, they would be paid. This would be a paid entry. How quickly can you bring somebody in? Yeah, I mean, if I had, if I knew the person, I could probably like, right now, and want to make them an offer. Um, I mean, if I knew the person, like right now, and want to make them an offer, it would take a couple of weeks. Yeah, I mean, heck, yeah, well, right. Um, but I'm, obviously, I'm going to bring someone in from the interview and all that. Um, maybe a month? Um, but the whole force is just starting. The Microsoft folks have been. Yeah. Yeah. I, I say that knowing that city government processing is for every time we try to hire someone, we get snags. Um, but in an ideal world, I think we could do it that quickly, especially because we're already hiring for some other positions. This one to be totally out of the blue. We actually had a data science center that was working on this who left for a full-time job. So that slot is still there. Um, we still have a plan in our, our, our budget. So, yeah. What GIS software are you using? Uh, so when it comes to GIS, I mean, the city typically uses our GIS. Um, I'm an R person, and I primarily use R for everything, and that includes um, geospatial stuff. Um, the health department, I just saw uh, one of the epidemiologists over at the health department it looks like maybe they're exploring QGIS because I saw him post like, a, like some slides that was kind of valuable and compared to QGIS. And then, I don't know, um, did Melanie use kind of geospatial tech tools in, in Python? And she used GeoPandas? GeoPandas, yeah. So it would be good in Python. Yep. So here's a question that I have. So if you're using Python, you're using R, yep. they're using Excel, um, what is this? What is the indexing look like at the city for the back end of any of your machine learning? Yeah. So I mentioned earlier. So like BCIT kind of houses a lot of our SQL databases. So I mean Python and R talk directly to SQL. Um, 
for other things, when I'm, you know, for some of the like city stat stuff, like you can even talk. I mean, Hook in Baltimore has an API. It's on the Socratic platform, and it has an API. So I'm usually just pulling straight from Hook in Baltimore when I can. Um, yeah. So most of those on kind of SQL service, and, and this is going to be an interesting case because um, we, it's not like we have a server running anything near what, what this would be, um, but Hopkins does, so that IDIES, they spun up something called Size Server, and it was really originally developed as a SQL database um, kind of tool for astronomers. They're massive databases of like images of the sky, <laughs> um, and but that's kind of where we, where we ideally are going to be storing data and kind of doing the modeling, um, just because they have a really really powerful resource that the city has nothing. <laughs> is, that, is the entry data here part of the open ball form, or is it? Yeah, it's a good question. I, it, yeah, I don't think that image is just like. Freely available, they can to like. Yeah, there are things like city view. So it's so cryptometry, not like something like that. So if you're using, if you're using cryptometry data, that's all in house. Which you can use. There's three inch statewide, or six and three inch statewide available um, from uh, from the state. Uh, the gets flown in every third year. Okay. Yeah. 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 Can you say that again? <laughs> so. Pinkometry itself is not licensed in a way that can be made available to the public. So that's going to be internal. You'll have to have accounts to get access to that. But uh, the counties and Baltimore City, through the uh, Emergency Systems Number Board from the state, funds a statewide aerial collection every uh, my, my shop manages the acquisition of it, so oh, it's my it. there you go. Um, and uh, so it's this past we just flew the Eastern Shore. Next year, apply the Western Shore, and then there's an off year. So every three years, essentially, you get updated uh, data for each side of it. And that's Thank three inch and six inch resolution. Awesome. Uh, yeah. Question. How, how much of, so I know that all the data is open source, but how much of that tooling and like, the processes that you have are publicly available? Like um, something like this model? Well, so this, so this isn't there. Thing yet. Like we've, we've done some preliminary work, um, but it's nowhere near being a, a live tool or anything like that yet. Um, and like I mentioned, a lot of the processing power, of course, power that we would be using is really Hopkins for this. Um, we would we basically need to figure out a way of citing the data pipeline from our SQL databases over the, the Hopkins. I mean, for the for the time being, to do that action exercise of just pure modeling, we'll probably just take snapshots of data off our SQL servers. Um, and move it over to, to Hopkins to the Sci Server platform. It's SciServer.org if you want to read more about what it is. Um, but basically, you can actually get Jupyter notebooks. Um, and, and it, it's basically, it, they spun it up as a way of collaborating with other astronomers and other researchers and other institutions. Any other questions? I know we're way over time. How does this impact decisions, like policy decisions? So let's say you're debating fixing up a house that's fake and blighted on a, in the middle of the street versus the corner. Is that yep. stuff being decided? Yeah, well, for one, that's definitely a question for housing. Um, they're... If more people see the intersection, right, the corner house so the, versus the... The corner houses are actually, okay, in terms of, like, some of the prioritization that happens, corners actually do stand out because you have an unsupported wall. Um, and if that wall deteriorates or crumbles, you've got a certain, those are more likely to fall. In fact, a couple of years ago, the building that fell, I think fell on a person who killed him who was sitting in his car, I think that was a corner or an edge. Yeah, it was, it was. Um, so uh, the housing department used to have kind of an analytics person who had gone and found it's actually a more complicated geospatial problem than you think to figure out which all where are all the end um, buildings because we've torn some down, right? So like you know that changes over time. If you have a new <coughs> entrance, you tear them down. Um, but that certain factors in, but for the other, yeah, you have to, like, have to talk about housing on how 
that's important. Right. Um, I, mean, I think I just want to. I think yeah. that, I mean that's that's an important question in, in this context. So I think one of the challenges that we sort of have touched on today is that I don't know that there's a lot of decision makers in the city that like when you tell them like, hey, this is a predictive model and like this is what it means, like really understand that I that it's you're really dealing in prob probabilities, and so like I don't think that we have done a good job yet of sort of preparing people to think through uh, what the outputs mean or could potentially mean in terms of like how to translate sort of decision. So like, I think that that's sort of the next area that like we probably internally need to work on to prepare people to think through how to receive outputs from these. Um, yeah. There's the safety issue, but then there's even like, how do I, how do we allocate our dollars because most amount of people drive on corners and at street lights and see abandoned homes on corners versus the middle of the street. And the, like the, the, how we feel about the city and the flight that we see with yeah. the impact. You know that it's funny, so the same researcher that we're going to work with to develop that occupancy model, he's already done a couple of studies with Baltimore data um, that's around optimization of exactly that problem. So he, he figured out a way of like setting um, um, your kind of thing you're optimizing towards, kind of buying plane or not. Um, a way of quantifying like how much for for the dollars that you have and the number of vacants that you have, how much it was almost like a quality of life measure. So like optimized for quality of life given budget, geography, um, and you know where the actual vacant. You know those, those are constraints. So there's been yeah, it's actually done some interesting things with the pre market valuation. Um, anyways, I just want to wrap up. Hopefully, uh, so my main message was like, like I said, who in the city is doing what with data? Hopefully, I can get to that we are <laughs> working towards uh, data stuff. Brought a great, you know, brought a great point about data literacy. Um, some of the stuff I touched on earlier around like, can we just start moving towards like 90 day rolling totals? Um, you know, bringing people along on the data literacy front is, is a huge component of just an internal bit. Um, capacity building. We've done our trainings. He's got his Python um, meetup. Um, the Data Fellows Program, once again, like working for a program manager, please apply. Um, external capacity, yes, we're always looking for help. We always hear from, from folks that are interested in helping out. Please talk to one of us. Babala has already thought through better pipelines and better kind of mechanics of how to get people involved. I understand there might have been a cult for Baltimore thing tonight with some Code for Baltimore people are probably here tonight. Code for Baltimore is another avenue. Um, but yeah, we're always open to ideas. Um, one thing I would also suggest is like a lot of people in agencies, myself included, we don't always Sometimes you need to set aside an hour or two in order to frame up a problem and set aside the right data to be able to hand it off in the first place. And not everyone has even that time to think through what's the thing I want to like spend time, break it off into a sizable chunk and hand it over to someone and then project manage on that. Um, so a really great thing that can help uh, if you do want to get involved is to just go and either propose something or just go and tackle something. Like I said, there's Open Baltimore. Um, or at the very least, come come with a proposal. Like if you have ideas on like how we might be using data better to clean the city, um, that's a huge mission of ours now, and we're starting to throw some data resources at it. If you have ideas on how we should be looking at that data, or how to better, better um, identify hot spots, or um, maybe optimize routes given hot spots, like please propose ideas. We're definitely open to that. Um, but thanks for coming. I know we're way over time. I hope this is what everyone was looking for. Um, thanks for coming.